Good evening. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church of Pittsburgh. I'm Tom Hall, Senior Pastor. It's a joy to welcome you to this special service on Christmas Eve. Our service will begin in a few minutes with our friendly music.
Merry Christmas. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church of Pittsburgh. Tonight we celebrate and worship the birth of the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, Jesus Christ. We invite you to follow us on Facebook and share the service with your friends. Join us for worship Sundays at 1045. Listen now as we prepare to light the Christ candle and begin our worship. in the mists of history, right up until the present day, people longed for a Messiah who would come in power to set all things right. Today, in our broken and hurting world, we long for someone who will bring justice to the poor, bring an end to the divisions among us, and bind up the wounds of the brokenhearted. To many people in our country and in our world today, the situation seems hopeless. But we know someone the ancient people did not. We know the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. In a moment, we'll join in singing about the dawn of a new age, the turning of the world. The words are from the song of the Virgin Mary, taken from the famous passage known as the Magnificat. Mary, a humble Jewish girl, was visited by an angel who told her that she would be the earthly mother of the Messiah. Mary believed the angel and trusted God. Though Mary was small, she believed that God would do great things through her. The world was indeed about to turn, and in that moment, it turned around a teenage Jewish girl named Mary. For each Sunday in Advent, we lit a candle to remind us of the approaching dawn of a new day. The Messiah is coming, and the world is about to turn. Tonight, we light the Christ candle to symbolize that the one true light has indeed come into the world. The forces of darkness are turned aside. God's new creation is beginning, and each and every one of us is filled with God's purpose and hope. Would you pray with me? Oh, gracious and loving God, we praise and thank you that your Son, Jesus Christ, the one through whom the heavens and earth were created, has come into his world. His love was so great, heaven couldn't hold him. But he wanted to be so close to us that he came as a babe in arms. We thank you that through Jesus Christ, all things are made new. We thank you for filling us with hope for our world, for those we love, and for ourselves. Help us to live into this hope each day. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to see Christ at work in our homes, our schools, our places of work, and in all creation. Amen.
would you join me in the prayer of confession? O gracious and loving God, we confess that we have made a life that is all about us. We love to be in charge of things, especially our own lives. We forget that your word tells us that Jesus Christ holds the key to life. Indeed, Jesus is the key to life. Lord, forgive us. Help us to give control to the one who knows us better than we know ourselves. Grant us the peace from knowing that no problem is too small or too great for the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Would you join me in a moment of silent confession? Friends, hear the good news. Jesus Christ came into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Hear the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen.
Merry Christmas, children. I'm so sorry that you can't be here with me tonight. I'm just so sad. Look who I'm holding. It's baby Jesus. And if you were here with me, I would let each one of you hold this precious baby, just like I'm holding him. I would, you would gaze into his eyes and just be in awe that you were holding baby Jesus. Now, baby Jesus is just too little to remember this night. Just like you don't remember the night you were born, the day you were born. So your parents, and maybe aunts and uncles and grandparents, tell you about the day you were born. So I'm going to tell Jesus what happened the night he was born. Oh, Jesus, the night you were born, your parents had found a place to stay where the animals were kept each night in a home. It was clean and dry, and when you were born, they wrapped you in cloths, and they put you in a manger, the place where the animals eat their hay. They were so glad to have you with them. And out in the fields, there were shepherds taking care of their flocks of sheep. When suddenly, there appeared an angel, and they were so surprised, and they were very, very scared. So scared that the angel said to them, don't be afraid, for I have great news. A child has been born this night in the city of Bethlehem. A child born for you, he said to the shepherds. And then suddenly, there was a cloud filled with angel, an angel choir and they began singing and praising God, and they sang glory to God in the highest and peace to all on earth. And then, just like that, they went away back into heaven. So the shepherds looked at one another and said, let us go into Bethlehem to see what the angel has told us about. So they went, and they found you, and they fell down and worshiped. And then they excitedly went back to their fields, telling others along the way that the Christ child, that you had been born. What a magnificent night. Let's pray. Oh, holy God, we thank you for this night, this night of nights, when the King of kings and the Lord of lords was born for us. We give you thanks. Amen. An Old Testament lesson from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. The people walking in darkness has seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, 
as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this.
The gospel lesson is from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. The Savior is born. He is in a manger. Good evening, friends. Merry Christmas. Would you pray with me? O oh, gracious and loving God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, open our minds and hearts to the wonder of that first Christmas. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh my, oh my, has anything gone this year the way we planned? Anything at all? And as if the pandemic wasn't enough with the hurt and the loss and the frustration, the lost livelihoods, the lost dreams. Remember, there were fires, and there were hurricanes, and there were riots. And, who, and of course, who could forget the election, the election? Even our Christmas celebrations, our Christmas worship, the way we were planning those things just a few weeks ago, they're not happening the way we planned at all. And now our leaders are telling us that we need to be safe by staying away from the plans we made for family and friends over the holidays. Jan and I had planned last summer to go to our 50th high school reunion, something we'd been looking forward to for a long, for a long time. And I was thinking about all the brides that we care for here in this church who had to change their wedding plans again and again and then some to cancel them entirely. Think about it. These young women had been dreaming since they were little girls about their big special day. 2020 was a year when nothing went according to plan. It was the year that we made do. But here we are, somehow. We've made it to Christmas. And as we celebrate and worship the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, we need to remember that first Christmas. And nothing happened that year that was the way Mary and Joseph had planned it either. 
I wonder, did Mary have big plans for her wedding day? Surely her family had been planning and saving for the celebration for a long time, the celebration that would have involved a whole village. But God had other plans for Mary, plans that were so strange and so wonderful that God had to send an angel to Mary to help her understand. And I wonder what plans Mary and Joseph might have made together. Did they dream of where they would live, how many children they might have, what were the names they would give their children? Did they hope to one day perhaps go up to, to Jerusalem for one of the great festivals? A trip like that would have required lots of planning. Did Joseph have plans for his carpentry business? And then there was the priest Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, who was Mary's relative. They certainly were not planning to raise a child in their old age, and they never would have dreamed that their child would be John the Baptist, the one God called to prepare the way for Jesus. Well, 2020 has been the year of government decrees, the government telling us where we could go and could not go, telling, telling businesses which ones could open and which ones had to close. But Mary and Joseph, they had their year interrupted by government decrees as well, a decree from Caesar Augustus which required that they go to Joseph, Joseph's hometown to be enrolled in a census. Surely, that was not something that they had been planning to do. Mary, after all, was expecting, and Bethlehem was 90 miles from where they lived. So the year that Jesus was born was a year of making do, hanging on, changing plans, and then changing them again and again. So many interruptions, so many hurts. They didn't know it, but God was going to redeem that year. That was the year around which time itself would turn. There was no way that they would ever have imagined that that year would become the year on which the world would base its calendar. They would never have imagined that billions of people over the centuries and a quarter of the world's population this very night would be celebrating the birth of their son. Now, some things are worth changing your plans for, even if you don't understand what's going on. Now, the story of the first Christmas has become so familiar to us for, for so long we have to work a little bit to try to recapture some of the wonder. So I hope you noticed a small but very important change that Frank, in the scripture that Frank just read for us. Biblical scholars, of course, are always interpreting and updating the scripture based on the latest scholarly research. Luke 2, verse 7, no longer reads, there was no room for them in the end. Now it reads, no guest room was available. The Greek word that is being translated here, translated here is katalima. Katalima, which means room or upper room or guest room, just that. But there is another Greek word for a commercial kind of inn, pandahion, pandahion. Luke used that word in the parable of the Good Samaritan, a place where it fits much better. Luke does not use that particular word here. The late New Testament scholar Ken Bailey, who lived in the Middle East for 60 years, was a friend of our church. Ken Bailey carefully thought and researched about why would we should be saying guest room instead of in. And many scholars, many scholars agree with Ken Bailey. He said that around the year 200 AD, there was a work of Christian fiction which had an imaginative account of the birth of Jesus. The story said that Mary had suddenly gone into labor and Joseph had to leave her alone in a cave while he ran off to find a midwife. It wasn't true, but it was very dramatic and it left people with the notion, apparently for centuries, 
that the birth of Jesus had somehow come as a sudden surprise. Now, it shouldn't surprise us that secular traditions sometimes influence the way we understand Scripture. For example, all of our nativity scenes have three wise men, and yet the Bible doesn't tell us how many wise men there actually were. It simply says that there were three gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And we celebrate Christmas, of course, on December 25th, but the Bible doesn't say the actual date of Christmas. And in the same way, we all grew up, we all grew up with the idea that Mary and Joseph arrived in Bethlehem with no time to spare, and that the baby Jesus was suddenly on his way, and then a heartless innkeeper slammed the door in their faces. Our Christmas plays, our Christmas music all reinforce this idea. But I wonder, could there be a better way, a better way to understand this? Luke says, for example, that while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. There's nothing to suggest, nothing at all to suggest that they arrived late or that Joseph was unprepared to provide good care for Mary. So why do we believe that? Well, think about what we have missed out on most this year. We missed out on touch, on personal contact, on hospitality, on the simple joy of just being with each other. But as important as hospitality is to us, it was way more important for the people of the Middle East. The way you welcome strangers was a matter of honor. If someone had turned away a pregnant girl, it would have brought them shame, not just on them, but on the entire village. And so, thank goodness, that is not what happened to Mary and Joseph. They'd gone to Bethlehem to enroll in the census because it was Joseph's hometown. He would still have had family there, people who would have remembered him. He would have said, I am Joseph, son of Heli, son of Mathat, son of Levi. And he had said that, and most of the homes in town would have been open to him. And because he was a descendant of King David, even more homes would have been open to him. And don't forget that Mary had relatives in the villages nearby. She had not long before visited her relative Elizabeth in the same region just a few months before. And so the problem was not a cruel innkeeper who slammed the door in their faces. The problem was that the guest room in the home where they were already welcomed was already full. Now in those days, peasant homes had one large room where the family lived and ate and slept. But at one end of the house, down a couple of steps, was the, was the room attached to the main room where the animals were brought in at night. And then carved in to the floor of the main room were troughs or mangers where the animals would feed. At the opposite end of the house, if the family could afford it, was a guest room or perhaps the guest room was on the roof. Today there are still homes in the region like this. And so Mary and Joseph weren't turned away. They were brought in by a family who cared for them as best they could. A family who changed their plans to welcome Mary and Joseph and Jesus. And so how do we know this is true? The shepherds. The shepherds. Remember the Old Testament had a high view of shepherds. Psalm 23, our most beloved psalm, pictures God as a shepherd. Jesus became known as the Good Shepherd. Of course, shepherds' work was hard. It was dangerous. Sheep were helpless, and they weren't too smart. They wandered off. The shepherd had to rescue them frequently. Sheep had to be constantly guarded against predators. But by the time Jesus was born, shepherds had lost much of their good reputation. They were at the bottom of the social and economic ladder. The rabbis considered shepherds unclean. So that night, I am pretty sure that the shepherds were not planning on being visited by angels. 
And nothing could have possibly prepared them for what the angel said. The Savior has been born to you. What? They would have said, what? Born to us? No way could the shepherds have believed that the Savior would have been born to them, born to kings, born to priests, born to prophets, maybe. But not them. But then the angel said this, you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And then slowly, it would have started to dawn on them. It might be true. The, ma- the baby might actually be born for us, born to people like us. The angel said the baby was wrapped in the same kind of cloths that poor women used. The shepherds would have thought, that's the kind of cloths our women use. And the angel said that the baby was lying in a manger, a manger of all things, not a bed in a palace. That meant he was born in a home like ours. He really had been born to poor people like us. And so the shepherds changed their plans. They said, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about So they hurried off and found baby Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger, just as the angel had said. They left and spread the word, and all who heard it were amazed. Did you see? Did you see? Mary and Joseph and the baby were just fine. They had indeed found shelter in the home of a peasant family who had changed their plans, made room, brought them in, and kept them safe. And Luke shows us it is all true. Luke said, The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as the angel told them. If the place had been freezing, if Mary and Joseph and Jesus had been shivering alone in a stable, if the place had smelled awful, do you think for a minute that the shepherds would have left them like that? No. No they would have immediately changed their plans again and invited them into their homes. They would have said, our home is yours. To do otherwise would have brought them everlasting shame. But they didn't do that. You see, because they didn't have to. Instead, they went home rejoicing, glorifying and praising God, not just because the Savior had been born, but because the Savior had been born for them. From God's perspective, there was nothing make do about the birth of Jesus Christ. It came about exactly as God had planned for all time. Friends, do you see? If you had never heard the Christmas story, if you were hearing it this year for the first time, you would be tempted to think, how 2020, how fitting. At least they were able to make do. But the truth is, the story is fitting. It fits God's great purpose. It may not fit our plans, but it it fits God's plan perfectly. God's plan was not just to make do. God's plan was to make all things right. And so this Christmas, would you welcome him into your home? Even if you have to change your plans The God who sent a trillion galaxies in place had planned for all time to come to us and be born into a manger. And he had planned that that would be the proof that the shepherds needed that it was true. Friends, God redeemed the manger. And then later, God redeemed the cross. And God will one day redeem this crazy year of 2020. And one day, God will redeem you and will redeem me. The Savior is born. He is born in a manger. Amen. Let us pray. Incarnate God, 
With the angels we sing and glorify your name, thankful for all that you have given us. For your presence in the world, we pray. We pray for our nation, Lord, that you will please bless it with uh, uh, wisdom and understanding, kindness and service, Lord. We pray for our community and its leaders. We pray for the witnesses of, our, of your church celebrating around the world. But today we are especially grateful for the gift of your son who gave up his heavenly home for a manger and a cross so that we might experience redemption, a gift that neither spoils nor fades. Lord, we pray with the angels. We also des desire peace on earth, a peace that is broader and deeper than the end of war. We pray for the restoration of this world, for the growth of your kingdom, for the reconciliation and healing and renewal. We bring before you our prayers. Lord, we pray for this nation and the nations of all the world. Lord, that you will truly bring peace, wholeness and completeness. We pray for our nation in uh, it dealing with the, the vaccinations and the dealing with restrictions. Lord, we pray for wise decisions to be made. We pray for our community, Lord, that has been ravaged by COVID-19. Lord, we pray for the church universal and its mission, and for those who minister in it. We pray for the local congregations here in the downtown Pittsburgh area and the ministry that it cooperatively works with and the ministerium. Lord, we pray for the particular needs of those who are sick, those who are hurting, and those who are uh, in need right now, Lord. Lord, make your incarnate presence known in each situation, and may we as your servants be vessels of your peace. We pray this in your Son's holy name, as you taught us how to pray the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Here at First Presbyterian Church, we strive very hard to praise God's name. We have taken great lengths through video and uh, this past year through online services. But not only that, we've taken great lengths to try to figure out ways to, to care for people uh, in our food distribution and uh, through our ways of caring and delivering food. But not just that. We've also cared for people in ways for prayer and reading the scripture and figuring out different ways that we can engage Jesus Christ. We are praising Christ's name in all that we do. And we ask for you to join us in that praising in many ways, through songs, through prayer, through praising, but also through giving of your tithes and offering. You're able to do that through a, a bulletin uh, has a QR code on it. And in that QR code, you could take a picture of that or you could follow a link from our Facebook page or our website on fpcp.org. We ask that when you give, we ask that you please give with a joyous heart. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it.
Friends, Mary and Joseph would have never imagined in their wildest dreams that that year that Jesus was born would have changed the world forever, that millions, billions of people around the world tonight would be worshiping the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Friends, this has been a crazy year indeed, but guess what? God redeemed that first year when Jesus was born. God will redeem this year. God will redeem your life. Christ is born. He is born in a manger. And now, may the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk with you on the road. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve. May the Christ who loves with a wounded heart open your heart to love. And may you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet. And may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you. Alleluia. Amen.